of a book by Charles King, who is not an anthropologist. He's some other, I think he studies like international relations or something, but he's a good writer. And so he wrote a book called Gods of the Upper Air, how a circle of <laughs> renegade anthropologists reinvented race, sex, and gender in the 20th century, last century. So this book is actually about Franz Boas, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, a couple of, Zora Neale Hurston actually, who was for a while a student of, of Boas. Um, and I've been tempted sometimes to assign this book for a class like ours, because it speaks to this idea that, I mean, sometimes when we're teaching anthropology, we forget or we, we either overestimate or underestimate the impact of some of these figures in the world. And so Charles King is going with a pretty big impact, a circle, a small circle of renegade anthropologists who reinvent race, sex, and gender which is a pretty big deal, right? I mean, that's pretty huge. Um, I don't assign this book in part because I feel like, it, you know, thousands, hundreds of anthropology professors try to do this lesson in anthropology classes just like this one. And why should Charles King get credit for it? I also don't assign it because I think he, he in some ways ignores some of the downsides of this or some of the other attributes that it wasn't, it wasn't as nice and clean of a reinvention as we might want to imagine. But it's a good, um, it's a good idea, or it's a good lesson to keep in mind, especially when we're reading this chapter about how anthropologists were really at the forefront of doing different things when it came to ideas about gender, ideas about sex, ideas about sexuality, uh, and some of the contemporary movements that we see today, uh, anthropology has either been in the mix or oftentimes at the forefront of that. Now, we always have to be careful to say that's in alliance with other people in other disciplines, and especially in alliance with people out there in the world who have been activists on these issues. But it's a good thing to sort of keep in mind, again, the influence of uh, anthropology as it was studying people in faraway places. One of those renegade anthropologists was Margaret Mead, who wrote what may have been one of the most famous uh, anthropology books of its time back in the day uh, around the, you know, the 1930s and 1940s, Coming of Age in Samoa, which I've shown you before, uh, I've shown you in relationship to uh, Bolstorff's coming of age and second life, because uh, there was a time when everybody knew this book, when everybody had read it, or not read it perhaps, but at least maybe had it around. And I was actually, when I looked for the title of it, I was rather shocked to see this terrible cover of it come out. But this is perhaps the way it would have been assigned to people in or picked up as a paperback with this awful, awful stereotypical cover. Um, and this would be a, be a mass market paperback. A study of adolescence and sex in primitive society. Let's get rid of that cover and go with the, uh, the, more, uh, <laughs> the more contemporary cover, the one that is usually used when people actually buy this book today if they assign it. Um, Basically what Mead was saying, and oh, she got into some terrible debates and, and uh, people really got angry at her even after she was, she was gone uh, saying that she'd misread the data. But the basic point of it was that, you know, coming of age in Samoa meant different things. And that sexuality and in turn, gender was variable across societies and cultures. That the way we did things didn't have to be the way everybody did things. And in fact, the way we did things didn't have to be the way we did things. And so Margaret Mead became not just, uh, she was not just an anthropologist, but a, a pop culture icon of sorts. One of my favorite titles for a book of essays, Margaret Mead made me gay. 
which, well, you know, I mean, no, this, no, this didn't actually happen, but it's funny to think about, uh, you know, personal essays, public ideas, is that by reading somebody or listening to somebody, you might think about how your life might be different than it is. And so for many people, reading anthropologists or reading uh, Margaret Mead, uh, didn't make them gay, don't get me wrong, but made people think differently about life and what the possibilities of life were. Now, I mean, we probably should acknowledge that this original cover is pretty bad too. And so a lot of people read anthropologists and just thought, boy, people are weird or sexualized over there in ways that that were problematic. And that's where we have to be careful about being too celebratory of the anthropological venture. Um, so that's one reason. And the other reason that we have to be careful about being too celebratory of the anthropological venture is that a lot of anthropologists during this time, so you had Margaret Mead and others doing their thing, but a lot of, uh, how to say, a lot of, as your textbook describes it, male anthropologists were going off and doing their culture studies and doing their kinship charts and coming back with circles and triangles. Or as we saw when we did our kinship charts, if you remember that person who was doing a kinship chart and we talked a little bit about it in class, pretty heteronormative kinship charts where everything is very regular and you only come in boys and girls and boys and girls get married to each other and have boys and girls all the way down the line. And so, you know, there were some very, like I said, heteronormative accounts. Uh, they were often accounts that were, were created by men who were talking to men in other societies. They often reflected an elite point of view or an elite bias, often a male bias. And so many of these studies were produced throughout the, you know, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, what we might consider the heyday of uh, as anthropology became a discipline and stopped being perhaps such renegades and started being a, a more established place where professors would explain kinship. And we talked about how anthropology became known as, in some places, as kinshipology, because it was trying to be more scientific and typologize the world. Now, in the 1970s, something great happened which is a number of people began to re-examine those anthropological studies and re-look at some of those kinship charts and the ways that people were organizing the world. And they suddenly thought, whoa, one, there's a whole bunch of weird anthropological data out there, which suggests that there are different ways of organizing ourselves. And two, why is it that there's so much patriarchy going on and what can we do about it? One of the key figures in this, which your, uh, your book mentioned uh, was a person named Gail Rubin, who wrote an article in 1975 called The Traffic in Women. It, <laughs> she was 26 years old when she wrote this article. I think, I don't even think she had a PhD at that time. She was a graduate student and she'd just been reading this material and came up with what is perhaps one of the most amazing articles of all time. Uh, she gets discussed, I think a couple, well, she'll come up with a couple different places, um, but I'm thinking she really gets discussed on page 288 there under queer theory. But for now, I, I wanna talk about her as an influence in feminist thought. Um, I found this, uh, I found this on Twitter, actually. It's a great kinship diagram of where Gail Rubin was emerging from. And I put it up here because some of these things we ourselves have seen before. So there's Marcel Moss. Some of you might remember uh, him from the body techniques and various ideas in, in French sociology and anthropology, uh, together with the idea of kinship structures and producing Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, again, one of the most famous French anthropologists who talked about sort of, you know, when, when Gail Rubin is talking about the traffic in women, one of the things she was talking about was 
was Levi Strauss's notion that the exchange of women was at the basis of society. And she was like, what? You know, I mean, yes, and why are you just talking about it as if it's this academic exercise? If there is some sort of exchange in women, which is at the basis of society, why are you just writing books about it and not doing anything about it? It's kind of one of her points. So you have Claude Levi-Strauss coming in there. Uh, also, uh, uh, the origin of the family private property in the state by Friedrich Engels. You might remember us talking about that in relationship to Marx. Engels and Marx were, were buddies. And in this in this book, he was talking about how uh, the the rise uh, or the rise of the bourgeois family, uh, and in some ways the need for it to be abolished. Um, and so, you know, again from the kinship chart, we have feminism coming in, was known as second wave feminism, which is influenced by Marxism, feeding into uh, her article, and then some stuff that we haven't talked about really that much at all: Freud and Macan and. Althusser, those, though, that's too, too crazy for us. We're going to leave that to the French to talk about. Um, but for, she brings together these things, but what I most want to talk about here is what that article then does. So it takes this old anthropology, these older uh, theories and ideas, but then put them to new uses. And I went back to the article and I have to say that the some of the first three sentences of the article are perhaps, we've talked about the so what question before, are perhaps the three most beautiful sentences about, you know, okay, we're trying to get rid of patriarchal oppression here. Uh, what do we need to do to do that? And why is theory, why are these ideas why is studying theory in anthropology useful for our activism? So the first sentence, or I mean the first sentence that I'm going to quote, is in the first paragraph, um, asks if patri, you know, if, if male dominance is the root, if innate male aggression and dominance are at the root of the female oppression. So what she's asking here is, is it biology? If it's biology, then, well, let's put it this way. If you're a feminist and you've decided, we figured out that it's just biology, it's just innate, then what do we have to do? Then what? You're trying to change the world. You know the world is bad. You know it's creating oppression for women. And you finally figured it out. You figured out that it's innate to men's biology. And that's what's the problem. Then what? Next steps. Huh? Kind of hopeless? No, Willa, don't give up. Be more hopeful. What do you got to do? <laughs> Suppress male biology. Yes, exactly. It is not hopeless. Then the feminist program would logically require either the extermination of the offending sex. Sorry, guys, you're done. Or also a eugenics project to modify its character. I guess... <laughs> Yeah, we want to be careful with the word eugenics here, but yeah, she's talking about some serious biological modifications. Either we get rid of men altogether, which frankly we could do now. You just freeze up a bunch of that stuff and, you know, sort it out and it'll be good. It'll be fine. So yeah, if it's innate biology, we have to take some serious steps. Don't be hope hopeless. What if it's capitalism? All right, so this is a second idea that was circulating in the 1970s. If sexism, sexism is a byproduct of capitalism's relentless appetite for profit, then, then what? What do we need to do? Next steps. Jonathan, what do we have to do? 
reject capitalism. That's right. And this is the 1970s, so people were fired up, right? Sexism would wither away in the advent of, of a successful socialist revolution. Oh, when was the last time we had one of those, right? So the idea is here, again, it's the 1970s. Uh, sexism is going to wither away in the event of a successful socialist revolution. Third sentence, if the world historical defeat of women occurred at the hands of an armed patriarchal revolt. <laughs> I didn't really know what to call this one. I'm going to call it culture or maybe history, right? So in this sense, what I think Ruben is saying, if there was some cultural historical moment that caused this, so it's not really biology, it's not really capitalism, it's something deep in our culture, then, then what? Well, you can't guess this one because it's the very best one. It is time for Amazon gorillas to start training in the Adirondacks. Wait, who lives in the Adirondacks? Jonathan, you kind of, almost. Nearby, near enough, yes. Have you seen these folks? No, they, this didn't happen, but it was a good idea, right? Like I said, three of the greatest sentences uh, ever made. If you want a so what question for your essay, how does theory relate to life? There you go. Boy, the 1970s were, were the best. They really were the best. Um, so what we're going to do here now is take these three questions in turn. Is it biology? Is it capitalism? Or is it culture? All right, so... Don't worry, we won't, we won't be trying to do any of these things. We won't be arming, arming any of you. Um, so, is it biology? Is it innate biology? Let's just throw it out there. What do you think? What, did, what would this chapter tell us? Jonathan's shaking his head no. Exactly. In fact, if you look at what we call sexual dimorphism between men and women, it's not very much. As our chapter tells us on page 282, uh, in terms of the evolution, there are a lot of primate species which have a lot more division, you know, in sort of size and weight and all those things between men and women. And uh, as they say here, it seems like males have become more similar. Men and women have become increasingly similar in size throughout evolution. And this seems to be the case, especially when we, we start feeding people in the same amounts, you know, I mean, in the old days, we used to give the protein to the boys and the men because they were supposed to be working on jobs and give the sugar and the, and the sweet stuff and the carbs to the, uh, to the women. And of course that would result in different, different body stuff. Um, if we even that out and let them compete in the same sports and things, then this also evens out. As they also say here, I, you know, those sexual dimorphisms in, in any group are averages. In any society, there will be some women who are stronger than faster than some men. It is worth noting that in most physical traits, there is an overlap between the range of female measurements and the range of male measurements. This casts doubt over the relevance of sexual dimorphism today. So basically, I think we can safely say that it is not biology. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there are no biological differences. There are biological differences, and we should always be aware of biological differences and take them seriously. But basically, one of the things that the feminists helped us understand is the difference between sex and gender. And you've probably been through this before, so we'll not, we'll just, we'll just hit it hit it very, uh, very quickly, which is to say that we, they created or separated out the word sex, which is part of the biological differences. So the physical differences, hormonal differences, 
anything that is uh, what we might call in nature or biological as different from the social roles and the expectations that we have when we see somebody who we think has those physical characteristics, which is known as gender. And so all around the world, we can see that people with the same biological differences often come with all different kinds of social expectations, roles, ideas about what goes with those biological organs and what goes with that, that hormonal stuff. And in the next class, when we talk about alternative gender identities, we'll even get more into that. But even if you're going to do a, a dualist, a binary between male and female, you can look historically or cross-culturally and see all kinds of different, different ideas that people have had about what goes with that biology. Now, I would just warn you that in today's world, people often mix up gender with sex. And so people will often talk and they'll use the word gender sometimes when they probably should use the word sex. So this is what's called a euphemism. People have decided that it's more polite to say gender uh, than to say sex. So sometimes this can be confusing. Um, but in the social sciences, when we talk about gender, we talk about, uh, we're talking about social roles and we talk about biology, we're talking about sex. I think that may be because people just don't wanna say sex, right? It's just too, uh, it's too, too, it's seen as too impolite, so they say gender. For example, sometimes you might have been to a gender reveal party when somebody's firing off a cannon or burning down a forest or something because they're having a boy or a girl. Um, those should actually be called sex reveal parties because they're usually telling us what they saw on an, on an ultrasound, the gender stuff that gets well, obviously it gets loaded on very early, but what they're revealing is the sex or the biology, what they think is the sex or biology of the, of the kid. But again, uh, just, uh, just a, a note there. So the question, the second question is, okay, if it's not biology, is it capitalism? Is it capitalism? Jonathan, is it capitalism? Oh, the Shay Wong Probably. It, it kind of was. They were in a hunter-gatherer society. They organized their general more egalitarian principles where while men did perform more physically strenuous tasks, they would, the roles would go back and forth depending on the circumstances. And then once they settled down outside of the hunter-gathering society into concrete housing, um, the men became the primary providers of the household and became their own people. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a really good example. Uh, I think you may be saying it better than me, the Chi Wong, Che Wong, Che Wong of Malaysia who, you know, many examples of this actually. I mean, this is just one of people who are, you know, when they are hunter-gatherers or when they are horticulturalists, uh, there's a lot of overlap between male and female roles. Um, they're often kind of interchangeable. There aren't really ways to store much wealth. So you can't have the same kinds of inequalities, but when, you bring them into a capitalist system and you start paying people and then somebody has to be the provider and then somebody can have money in the bank. Um, the gender roles often get exacerbated and revved up. And this is sometimes difficult for us to understand because we want to believe that we live in the most liberated gender society ever, when in fact our own society or our you know, what we might call colonialism and capitalism has often led to more uh, inequalities between men and women than are present in many traditional societies.
That said, it can't be just capitalism. And one of the reasons is, is that you see various ideas about gender, uh, even in some of those studies of hunting and gathering societies like the San, the classic study that Richard Lee did, where he talked about how in some ways, yes, the women were providing most of the calories in terms of their gathering and what they were doing. If you measured it out in percentages, they were contributing more. But the men were going off and doing this hunting stuff and coming back and people would get all excited about it. And so even in a society in which the, in which the, it was, you might say traditional or hunting and gathering, there was a still some, some gender stuff going on and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't equal. So um, we could talk about capitalism and we certainly should a lot about this, but it doesn't seem to be necessarily the source of gender inequality. And I'll just say, that during the 1970s, people also figured out that the movements against capitalism weren't always, uh, weren't always equally, or weren't, weren't always even taking women into account. And uh, we see that uh, through even today's social movements that oftentimes these are very masculinist movements. And so certainly in, in parts of the non-capitalist world, there were some strides made, maybe even large strides in terms of, of gender stuff, but in other ways, uh, it didn't seem to exactly do the trick. And, uh, and certainly in the movements themselves, I mean, one of the main reason we had feminist movements emerging in the 1970s is because the Marxists were being so stupid about this and they were being so male oriented. So it didn't seem to be, it certainly wasn't true that these differences faded out in, in actually existing socialism. And so it probably wasn't capitalism. So what are we left with? Culture. This looks almost like a mathematical formula. Haley, what is this? Yeah, very nice. So this is, yes, this is, if we were to ex do this as a logical expression, and I don't do logic, leave that to the philosophers, but is female to male the same or like, is female to male as nature is to culture? As Haley put it, are women everywhere because of certain biological functions, lactating and menstruating and, and, uh, and child birthing and all that wonderful stuff, are they always associated with the natural side of things, the rooted earthy side of things, whereas men can go off and talk and be political and go off and, and do all their man things because they're associated with public life and this idea of culture. Really interesting, right? Really interesting idea. I mean, the idea here is, is there all across the world a universal gender binary, right? You'd have to have that female and male thing, which a lot of people say, yeah. And is there universal male domination? Is it because men are able to occupy the public or the political sphere or the economic sphere and have pushed or, or consign women to the natural sphere, is that what is going on? 
Now, like I said, super interesting idea, um, really productive idea in terms of how people looked at things. That said, uh, as people started to look at this idea more closely, there were a couple of things that people started to question. One was the idea that there was a public-private divide equivalent to our own divide between, say, home and, 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 uh, and the, the public. Um, so, you know, I mean, even in, I saw this in my own field work in Latin America, which might be considered to be uh, very much along the lines of some of these ideas. But in that society, the women were the ones who were out in the marketplace and doing the marketing, and the men were often the ones doing the farming, which was seen as a more domestic task. So is there a public-private divide, and does it fall along the lines of, of gender in this way is one of the questions that was asked. Or, and, is there a universal divide between culture and nature? This is something that we in the West or in Western societies divide between what is natural and what is culture, but is that something that other societies uh, have in mind? And here we see the importance of someone we've seen before, the work of Marilyn Strathern in Papua New Guinea. She's the one who gave us the idea of the individuals. And so uh, she was very questioning about this idea that, you know, people come as these individual types and that you can classify everyone as male and female. Uh, she argued that uh, at least in many places in Papua New Guinea, people were not seen as, as some sort of, you know, that those kinds of things would be more divided, processual, and flowing, and that the whole idea that there was a divide between culture and nature, uh, which with culture being superior to nature, was itself a Western imposition. The other thing that this, uh, this formulation left out, and that in general the feminists of the 1970s, who were usually drawn from the who were usually uh, uh, white feminists, Western white feminists, uh, is the perspective of other, uh, of other societies, of people of color, of women of color. And so I put up a couple, I just want to show you a couple books that were cited here. Really interesting work. I, I put this up as the, the web image uh, for our our, our text, there's a couple of books that are actually by uh, African feminists. Um, and again, really, I like, that's one of the reasons I like teaching this textbook is because it, it brings out some perspectives that I hadn't, had, hadn't seen myself before. So here's a great title, The Invention of Women. And again, this is by an African feminist. And what Oyewumi is asserting here is that uh, the, the whole idea that there are genders and that there are even women is a Western construction, which would be, whoa, that's, uh, that would be crazy, but really interesting. I mean, the, I, I think she's, if I'm not mistaken, arguing that the, that the idea of the visual and the visual representation was crucial in this whole creation of a category of women. I'm not sure we're ready for that. That's like, that's heady stuff, but uh, really a, a, a very new and interesting perspective. Similarly, Ifi Amaduame wrote a book called Male Daughters, Female Husbands. Whoa, gender and sex in an African society argues that in pre-colonial society, sex and gender did not necessarily coincide. Well, there you got it, male daughters, female husbands. That would be really interesting too. So, I mean, I guess this is just to say that from the perspective of uh, people of women of color, especially uh, black feminists, African feminists, uh, some of these things just didn't work the way Ortner uh, wanted them to work. It's a really interesting idea. We get to, uh, uh, the text says that Ortner herself later challenged her own ideas, suggesting that her claim that male dominance was universal was perhaps overstated. So 
I mean, this was again, the heady ideas of the 1970s. Ortner came in for a lot of critique or uh, challenge. And then she herself re-examined this and said, well, maybe, maybe I was overstating things. So in this chapter, uh, our authors use the term that the patriarchy is almost universal. Jonathan wanted to know how many. I guess I would say lots, right? It's a lot. It's widespread. I don't know if I, I myself, I don't want to say almost universal. I would just want to say widespread. There's a lot of patriarchy out there. And then they kind of back that up a little bit later. They say, well, it's not necessarily that patriarchy is universal, but it's the universality of patriarchal ideology. So in almost every society, even if we might not say that they are patriarchal, we can probably find some ideas about patriarchy that are, that are important. So I guess I would just say that, yes, the feminists still have a huge point, and they're very right, and they may need to start training in the Adirondacks because this is almost universal. But I guess here I would emphasize the almost or that there's a lot of things that we might, uh, how to say, when we look cross-culturally and historically, we might question the idea that everything breaks down exactly as according to what uh, Ortner is saying, as Ortner herself has questioned. So in the last part of the part, or the last part of what we read, there are several examples of different kinds of societies that have different ideas about, uh, about the distribution of roles. Uh, talk about the Hopi, for example, and a lot of the power that in the Hopi comes from, from reproduction. And we might call this, or I'm gonna call it, the power of being in a matrilineal society where inheritance and uh, and land and names are handed down through matrilineal roles. Now we talked about this before in terms of kinship, being in a matrilineal society doesn't mean you're in a matriarchal society. And in fact, there, to our knowledge, there are no matriarchal societies that would be a kind of mirror image to patriarchal society. But oftentimes, being in a matrilineal lineage can make things, can even things out a little bit or make or provide more power to people who are uh, handing things down along the female line. And of course, this is not just the Hopi. This is seen in, in matrilineal societies across the Americas and in different parts of the world. Uh, the percentage of matrilineal societies is less than that of patrilineal societies but still decent number of societies, quite a few. Other societies for various reasons are, they may not, they might be patrilineal or bilateral or may not even care that much about kinship, but they have what we call near equality. So they give us the example of the Vanna Tanai, uh, near gender equality. Um, you know, I mean, things are just, are just pretty close. And we can talk about how historically that is influenced and exacerbated or changed by capitalism and colonialism. But there's a lot of societies where things are fairly equal, near equality. And then there's actually an example that we've seen before, which is the idea that comes to us from the Andes. That's that that part of South America, down the western side of South America, where the Inca Empire was, uh, the idea of Andean complementarity, what is sometimes called Andean parallelism. Aaron, what is this? Yeah. Uh huh.
do work that is traditionally like viewed as being like a male job, like farming. Um, but the flip side of that is you need a partner to be considered like a whole person. And that was the idea that they would like. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, we see that we, we looked at this a little bit before Knessa's work. And I mean, it's it's not just among the Aymara, although it's sort of particularly pronounced there, but it happens in some ways uh, through many different societies in the Andes. It, it's probably an idea that predates, uh, like I said, it's probably predates colonial rule. So it's a pre-Hispanic uh, idea that nevertheless carries into the present. And you know the basic idea is okay. Yes, men and women are very different. Uh, and then, as you said in your post, it is kind of it gets bizarre in our sense because you need two of them before you even become a whole person. So you need to be. And if you, you know, I think uh, as they put it before, like if if you die without being married, you're buried with a, a, a animal, a non-human animal of the opposite of the opposite sex. So it's pretty, you know, that becomes pretty serious. So yeah, I mean, we definitely don't want to recommend this for people to adopt, but the overall idea in terms of tasks or, or worth is that, you know, there are two separate genders, but they are equally important and you need both. And so they're both on their own track parallel or they are complementary to each other in, in, in some ways. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess I'm, what kind of gives me pause here is whenever I think about this, I think about the famous idea of being separate but equal, right? And, you know, I think that you know, usually when we look at, at societies from an objective perspective, uh, the idea that people are, oh yes, we're just different. We're just in two separate but equal spheres. You're like, really, truly, is that true? Um, so, I mean, I think we can be skeptical, skeptical, but in some senses, I think they do carry this out. Like I said, in part, because it's, it's a fairly uh, deep tradition predating colonialism. And the idea is that, you know, you need, you can't, you can't have just one and they are of equal, equal value. So this is something that, you know, is, is, a, is a way of worth thinking about as one of the examples of how uh, in, in other societies, um, people uh, have uh, equalized things or have, are examples of how we can use culture, in fact, to, uh, to promote uh, relative equality. All right, I'll talk here a little bit about the sexuality part, which comes up some in this section, but is going to kind of lead us in as important as we talk about, uh, about our next theme for, uh, for Tuesday on alternative gender identities. Um, in this part of the reading, they start talking about sexuality and they tell us for one thing, we don't want to confuse gender, which is ideas about biological difference with sexuality, which is ideas about how people are, uh, how, how people are, are sexual, erotic, reproductive and non-reproductively with each other. And um, the first point that we want to think about here is that when we look at across human societies, nature, um, we see everywhere that there are heterosexual acts, of course, you have to have some of those. And everywhere there are also going to be some homosexual activity. And as we'll talk about later, there might be some third gender activity going on, but that doesn't mean that people, I, identify as being one thing or another. So whenever we look at human societies, we can certainly classify what's going on as heterosexual and homosexual activities, but that doesn't mean that people necessarily identify. The idea that people come with an identity as, oh, I am gay or I am straight is relatively recent in human history. It probably comes to us 
Some people have argued it actually comes to us as late as the 1950s in the United States um, when these kinds of identities develop and are, and, and are promoted. Now, I mean, there's, no, there's not necessarily an advantage or a disadvantage to not having this be an identity. It's just interesting to note that these kinds of activities occur everywhere, but that's not necessarily uh, significant in terms of people's identity. So the whole classification of people or that you would be born as one or the other is a fairly recent idea that we've come up with. And as your text makes clear, even today, the definition of who considers themselves to be gay or who considers themselves to be heterosexual or homosexual has a decent amount of cross-cultural or social variability. And so uh, a couple things here. I mean, one of these is a famous example on page 289 from many Latin American societies where people uh, might have sex, men might have sex with other men, but it, that doesn't make you a heterosexual or a homosexual. The hetero part is the person who is doing the, oh, it's too early in the morning for this. The heterosexual is the penetrating partner. And so you can be a heterosexual male and have heterosexual, I mean, homosexual sex, but if you're only doing the penetrating, you maintain your identity as a heterosexual. Phew, okay. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's a different idea than, than would we would have in our own society about where these lines and, and identities are drawn. And they make the interesting point that this, this actually had a practical application uh, during the HIV or HIV and transmission ideas in Africa. I mean, because in our own country, we identified uh, HIV with homosexual uh, sex and, and gay, gay homosexual identity, when it came to public health ideas in Africa, that's where people were looking. Um, and then, but they didn't see that people were perhaps engaging in these kinds of activities, but definitely not identifying uh, in the way that, that people in uh, the US or, or Western Europe would be uh, in terms of, of an identity. So it actually has a, it has a practical effect for people who are working in areas like public health, you just have to be very aware of what's going on in terms of, of local and cross-cultural definitions. These ideas have been part of what our authors uh, talk about in terms of what is called queer theory, which is a perhaps a, a more recent uh, theoretical idea. Uh, the term queer is one of those terms that was an insult uh, and but was appropriated by people uh, to indicate a, a kind of uh, resistance to uh, norms that were being imposed. Um, some really interesting uh, material here and in some ways uh, drawing on some earlier uh, arguments. So again, uh, we saw Gail Rubin's work, The Traffic in Women, as it was, as it was used in terms of feminism, uh, but she has also been hugely important in terms of, and I guess when I'm saying she all the time, I think that she herself argues for, a, for a, an androgynous society, uh, hugely important in, in understanding uh, queer theory and ideas about uh, different kinds of, of sexual, sexual activities. Um, the other crucial, or one of the crucial sources for what, what has become queer theory are the ideas of Judith Butler, uh, going back to a book called Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. And one of the things Butler is arguing is that gender is something that we perform. It's often a performance. It's something we learn to perform and we're rewarded, rewarded for doing a good performance and we're penalized for doing a bad performance. And 
you know, I mean, it, it's a performance. It, it starts to feel very natural for many, many people because it comes to us from an early age when these, when these, uh, these ideas are, are put into place. But it was a, a sort of um, a, a fairly revolutionary idea uh, in thinking about uh, gender identity as not just something that you acquire or is fixed, but as something that uh, is developed, is changeable, is something that is performed across your life. So queer theory has been really important in uniting some of these streams uh, that we've seen before and takes us, takes us one step further, you might say. Now, we got to the part of, are we read right up to the section on alternative gender identities, which again takes us further. I would say that we are also in some ways going back. A lot of things we think about today as, oh, people are developing alternative gender identities. It turns out, or I hope we read about how it turns out that these are ideas that have been with us in different parts of the world, uh, in different parts of history. Some of them are very old ideas. So we are not, we're not the first to come up with different alternative gender identities. That is what we'll read for Tuesday. Um, we'll finish this chapter uh, mostly uh, along the lines of alternative gender identity stuff. So in this class, we basically covered uh, mostly the feminism, the binaries, the dualisms, the patriarchy, went into a little bit of sexuality and queer theory, but uh, we'll take up the, uh, the, the more, the stranger stuff, you might say, on uh, Tuesday. All right. All right. <laughs>